Hello, hello. Good morning. Uh, selamat pagi. Ciao san. Ciao an. Good morning. <laughs> uh, it's Saturday morning, and I tried baking this morning. Uh, looks quite looks okay actually. Yeah, let me show you. Wow, wow, very hot, very hot. <laughs> yeah. Looks like this. Looks like this. <laughs> Supposed to be some kind of banana pudding, banana bread, but actually it's quite disgusting. It doesn't. I didn't put enough uh, flour. I didn't have any eggs either, so it actually comes out as banana. It just comes out as this kind of mush. Okay lah. Yeah, edible. I'm eating banana porridge. Anyway, okay, hello and welcome to the Daily Bible Reading Show. Today is Saturday, and I'm going to read just two of the passages beginning of the day, uh, just to start the day off with two uh, chapters from the Bible. Let me look up what we are reading today. Yeah, I need to prepare better. Okay, today is Saturday, March the twentieth. We are looking at Exodus chapter thirty-one and John chapter ten. Ah, Good Shepherd. Okay, we're going to look at that together today. Um, how are you doing today, by the way? Uh, weekend already, and at least here in the UK, the weather is so nice. Oh, yes, I see that it's quite cloudy or so, <laughs> but still better than it being cold or rain. Uh, stuff you can still do outdoors. Actually, when it's cloudy, right, it's nice to go out for walks by the river, and then as you walk uh, in the cool weather, you warm up. So that's a nice thing to do. Uh, maybe something I do right after this. Uh, after today's reading, uh, but yeah, what are you doing? Are you chilling out? Are you, uh, I don't know, watching TV, uh, reading your Bible? That's always a good thing to do. And tomorrow is uh, Sunday, yeah, church. What um, is Easter next week? Uh, when is Easter twenty twenty one? Sunday, fourth April. Okay, so tomorrow is the twenty first. So it's the Sunday after next. So we are two weeks away from Easter. Yeah. Okay. Something to look forward for forward to. Yeah. Uh, wonder what your church is doing. Are they doing some online thing? Some Easter celebration? Good Friday. That's also very very worth uh, remembering Jesus' death for us on the cross. Yeah. Maybe we'll do something special on the daily Bible reading show as well. Yeah. Something to look forward to. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by praying, and then let's look at those two passages together, Exodus chapter 31 and John chapter 10. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for this season when we can count down to the cross, when we can remember that journey that Jesus took to Jerusalem to bear our sin, to take our shame, to die our death. And Lord, as we journey um, in this life and journey with you in your word, uh, help us to keep in step with your spirit, constantly listening out and submitting to him. Help us, Lord, to live lives that are pleasing to you. And Lord, as we come to your word today, give us hearts that will be obedient, that will listen, that will want to treasure each and every spoken word to us in your, in your written word, <laughs> um, but also want to apply it to see this as such a good thing, to be able to hear your voice. So please speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Exodus chapter 31. I love doing these morning Bible studies. Then, you know, it kind of sets the pace for the entire day. I don't know if you get that. You know, you read something, and then for the rest of the day, you're just chewing on it and chewing on it and wondering, you know, how does this apply today? How does this shape the way that I see the world today? Um, I find that so helpful for me, actually. Um, okay, so uh, Exodus chapter 31. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I filled him with the Spirit of God. Interesting. He's filled this guy named Bezalel with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. It's interesting that he's called this person, filled him with his spirit. I think this might be the first occurrence in the whole Bible where God says he fills him with his spirit. Well, he fills Adam with his breath, and that's also 
um, the same word spirit, breath, wind. But here, this specific uh, task of filling is so that he will have this ability and intelligence and knowledge and all craftsmanship, you know, this skill uh, to be able to do this piece of art. You know, it's, it's not just filling him with um, Bible study knowledge, all these answers, but actually this ability to be able to craft all the different elements of the tabernacle of this tent of meeting. And verse 4, it continues to devise artistic designs, creativity, to work with gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. Verse 6, And behold, I've appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamak, of the tribe of Dan. And I've given to all able men ability that they may make all that I've commanded you, the tent of meeting, and the Ark of the Testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils, and the pure lampstand and all its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stands. We, we looked at that over the last few days, all these different pieces of furniture <laughs> in God's house. You know, you go to Ikea, you go and you buy a couch, uh, you buy, you know, different fittings and fixtures, you know, the lamp, your sink, that kind of thing. God has that equivalent. He has the basin, that sink to wash. Um, he has uh, the altar, that barbecue, maybe like the kitchen. He has the living room. He has the coffee table, the ark, uh, which is this huge box. And in it, he puts the, the two tablets of the testimony. So all these different pieces of furniture have to be constructed by someone who has the skill and the creativity. And the way that God gives him that skill and creativity, creativity sorry, is by filling him with his spirit. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, God gives him the ability by filling him with his spirit. Uh, where are we? Verse 8. Uh, is it verse 8? The table and utensils and the pure lampstand with all its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin and its stands. And it's finally worth garments, the holy garments. Oh, even the clothing of the of the priests, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priests, and the anointing oil in the fragrant offering, fragrance incense, sorry, for the holy place. <coughs> Excuse me. According to all that I've commanded you, they shall do. So Moses gets the plans, the IKEA plans. He passes it on to Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, in verse two. And his assistant, uh, assistant, verse 5, Aholiab, the son of Ahisamak, the tribe of Dan. These two guys have been given that ability and just the craftsmanship to create, you know, all kinds of things. You know, they have to do woodwork, they have to do metal work, they have to do needlework, you know, sewing all these clothes uh, and with intelligence and ability and craftsmanship. Amazing. So uh, you think of all the New Testament in references, you know, you just take it for granted, you know, fill with the Spirit. We're just looking at that just a few days ago in all the New Testament readings. You're, we are filled with the Spirit. Jesus is filled with the Spirit. And in the first instance here in Exodus 31, it's God giving His Spirit for this specific purpose, almost sanctifying them and calling them to do this specific purpose to serve Him. And so this filling of the Spirit is, uh, on the one hand, it's very specific, you know, so that God has called you to do that thing. That's why he's given you his spirit and it manifests itself in these interesting ways. Creativity, who would have thought of that? You know, you think filled with the spirit means you can lead Bible study very well, which hopefully it does. You know, it's the spirit of God that gives us the understanding and the mind of God. But also anything that God wants us to do, he equips us, not just with that natural skill, but this almost supernatural presence of his spirit. Worth thinking about the next time, um, you know, you're doing something that is in service in the church, you know, you're playing music tomorrow and playing music for Chinese church, I have to practice later. And there is that element of having to practice and doing the work, you know, they still have to chop the wood, they still have to sew the needle work, but the skills and the particular maybe application of that for church, for God, for building up God's people, that might come actually supernaturally through the Spirit of God. And, you know, th I think that's very encouraging. Uh, that's very purposeful. It's very purposeful that God has equipped me and is pointing me in this direction. So I want to always keep in step 
keep in obedience with the Spirit of God. Verse 12, And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days you shall work be done, but the seventh day, the seventh day, the Sabbath day, is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. You notice this occurrence is holy, you know, verse 13, sanctify you means holify you. Verse 14, the Sabbath is holy to you. Verse 15, every verse, holy to the Lord. In a verse 16, therefore the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant, as this contract forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So there's this element of being sanctified and set apart. This is a holy day, and therefore you shall keep this holy. How? By not working. You think that would be a good thing, an obvious thing. You shouldn't work. You don't have to work on the Sabbath day. But it also speaks to that temptation to want to work. And this might be not just working and just keeping busy. You know, all of us, it's hard, isn't it? When you say, stop doing what you're doing and not do that, not concentrate on that email or in that task, but as you rest in God, it can be challenging, can be challenging to do. But also it shows that it reflects God's rest. You know, God worked and God finished the work of, crea of creation. Six days he worked, he created everything and he's resting now. And he's almost inviting us into that rest. And he says in verse 17, that refreshment. We need to be filled again with God's presence and God's rest. They're pointing to creation, but for us as New Testament Christians, I guess, pointing to the new creation, no, Jesus has finished the work of salvation. So this is talking about creation, but the new creation is talking about that finished work of the new creation of salvation. And Jesus invites us into that rest, which means, you know, what does it mean for us as Christians today to fulfill and to observe this Sabbath command? Yes, it means putting aside that day, you know, that purposeful 24 hours where we can just live for God and not for that particular task, but enjoy and be refreshed in Him. I think rightly, you know, um, many of us use Sunday for that. You know, we come together and we listen to God's Word. He fills us with that rest and refreshment through His voice and through His commands and through His gospel. But also, I think it's just recognizing that we need to be saved. You know, that's, that's the idea. It's, it's meant to be in the same way that their rest points forward to, G, to God's rest. So our rest is meant to point forward to Jesus' rest. He's almost inviting us to be with Him in salvation. And He's saying, I'm looking forward to that, to that relationship, that time when I can maybe rest and, you know, have that meal with Jesus, have that relationship with Jesus. And somehow, somehow, the, the way that I spend today, reflecting all that work and now in this rest, reflecting on that pattern of work and now in this rest in Jesus points forward to that rest, ultimate rest that I'll have with Him. How wonderful is that? To be able to have that space of time, that peace of mind to reflect. What was that going to be like? You know, to have that relationship with Jesus such that nothing needs to be done. You don't have to achieve anything. You don't have to do anything. It is done for you, Jesus did that work and he calls you to enter into that rest and to be refreshed. Verse 18, And he, God, gave to Moses when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And I think we'll learn more of this in the coming chapters. But these two tablets uh, written, the Ten Commandments given to Moses, he's up on the mountain, it's just him and God hearing all these instructions, but written with the finger of God, you know, not with the pen of God or the um, word processor of God. <laughs> but the idea of finger of God, we've seen that in Exodus means only God could have done this. There was an incident 
with Pharaoh, where、um, the magicians tried to copy, you know, the the work that miracle that Moses did, and they couldn't. And they said, "Oh, this is done by the finger of God." Meaning, these words, these commands, could only have come from God and God Himself. No one else could have come up with this. No one else could have spoken like this to Moses, but God. Only this God has done so with Moses. Only this God has done so with us. Exodus chapter thirty-one. There you go. Our second reading for today.、Uh, hello, if you've just joined us,、uh, this is the daily Bible reading show. And on Saturdays, what I do is I split the readings into two. I do a morning reading, and It's Saturday morning here, and this is the second of the two readings I'm doing this morning. This is John, chapter ten. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, back door, <laughs> that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door, the front door, is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls to his own sheep by name and leads them out. Interesting that this shepherd knows every sheep, has given every sheep the name, and he calls out, "Hey, Calvin!" <laughs> Imagine a sheep called Calvin, and the sheep、bah, comes up to Jesus, and he recognizes, "Hey, it's Jesus who knows my name, and I recognize Jesus' voice." And this Jesus leads me out into the fields. Verse four: When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. This is a shepherd who doesn't need to push the sheep from behind. He walks ahead of them, and as they hear him speaking, they follow him from behind. Imagine that: you know, Jesus in front, and all the sheep going ba ba ba, because they recognize that's Jesus, that's my master, that's my shepherd, and we follow him based on his voice. Verse five: A stranger will not follow. But they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. You know, Jesus talking about being able to recognize him based on his voice, being able to recognize him、um, because he comes via the front gate. You know, it's it's open to him because he's recognized as this true shepherd. Everyone else who comes by the back gate, they do it in a sneaky way. <laughs> they surprise you, ah,、oh, and you have no idea who they are. But you know, you recognize Jesus, and Jesus recognizes us. That's a very special thing about this passage. It's not just talking about how do we know Jesus, how do we see Jesus as this great shepherd, but also how does Jesus see us as sheep. <laughs> he sees us as smelly sheep. Sheep are not just cuddly things, you know,、uh, uh, very cartoonish things, you know, that you go, oh, so cute, sheep. But sheep are stupid, are smelly. They're very rebellious. They tend to run away. But for some reason, this good shepherd comes, and the sheep recognizes and follows this this shepherd just based on his voice. And that's who we are. That's who he is to us. Verse seven. So Jesus again said to them, "Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy." I came that they may have life, and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I'm sorry.、Uh, <laughs> so、I, I need to turn off my curry. I, I'm cooking. I, I was wondering what's that smell. I've been cooking curry for the last twenty minutes. So I'm just going to turn off the fire and be back in two seconds. <laughs> I can smell the curry. Smells good. <laughs> Where are we? I'll, I'll pick up again from verse eleven. Jesus says, "I am the good shepherd. Good shepherd, not just a shepherd, but a good shepherd." What does it mean for Jesus to say that He is this true, this loving, this good shepherd? And He says, "The good shepherd 
lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. He runs away and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep such as his love for the sheep his invested love for these animals that he's willing to die for them can you imagine that you know would you be willing to die for your friends you know there's a sheep you know much less but the idea of the sheep in the old testament especially it's talking about the leader of God's people. You know, Abraham had sheep. You know, Moses, we saw he was keeping sheep and he was tending sheep when he met God on the mountain. And later on, we find out great kings like David, he was a shepherd when he was young. And this activity or this profession of looking after sheep and caring for them and protecting them, these are such skills and character traits of good leaders of God's people such that when God's leaders don't look after God's sheep or God's people, God will actually call them bad shepherds, you know, evil shepherds or unloving or false shepherds. And here Jesus therefore is contrasting between the good and the bad, the good and the unloving, and also the shepherd and the hired hand. So he says he's the good shepherd, but if you were to be tended by a hired hand, meaning it's just an employee, you know, someone who is just working um, a job, you know, I'm just looking after you, but because for the pay, I'm getting paid to do this job for you, to look after you. He says, the moment there's trouble, there's danger, he runs away. He says it there, you know, he who is the hired hand, not the shepherd, he does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and he runs away, he flees. Why? Because he's a hired hand. He cares nothing about the sheep. So on one level, Jesus is talking just about being a good leader of God's people. What does it mean to be the king? What does it mean to be the pastor of God's people? You know, the word shepherd just means pastor. It means someone who is loving, someone who cares for his people so much that he doesn't run away at the first sign of trouble. And he says he is the good shepherd, the ultimate shepherd, because when he sees that trouble, he's willing to die and lay down his life for the sheep. So even you know, good uh, pastors and leaders don't normally do that or are expected to do that. But Jesus being the ultimate shepherd, he does that for his sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. He says again, I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my Father. So Jesus says again and again, you notice it, I lay it down, I lay it up my accord. No one takes this life from me, but I lay it down. And the idea of lay down is something that is standing, that is standing and standing firm like this, like this Bible, and then you lay it down. It's not as knocked down, but that Jesus is, Jesus is standing and Jesus takes his life and he puts it down intentionally. It's always of his will, always of his control, even whenever he lays down his life for his sheep. It shows Jesus' willingness and Jesus' power to give his own life for us. Notice that he says, no one takes it from me, verse 18, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to do this, Jesus says this. And you have the authority, therefore, to take it up again. He's talking therefore of the cross as something that's not an accident. Jesus willingly lays down his life on the cross, dies for us. And he has therefore that ability to be taken up again. His father raises him up again. 
all this displays God's power when He dies, but also when He is raised again. So that's so important. It's so important. This shepherd, when he dies, he's not a loser. You know, bad shepherd. You know, how come? How come? You think of uh, a, a CEO of a company that suddenly loses his job, or a pastor gets kicked out of his church, or uh, someone uh, like maybe just a protector, like um, a guard of this a company. You know, they see see guards in front of him, and he gets shot in the in due course of his work because he's protecting them. You think, oh, a stronger guard, a stronger shepherd would have survived, but no. Jesus says, in order to protect them. I have willing. I've done this intentionally, and actually, I even have the power, therefore, to take up my life again. So it shows his authority and really his status as this pastor, shepherd, king. But also notice where did he, does he say this? He talks about other sheep. Um, verse sixteen, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So he's talking to you, you know. In that context, he's talking to his disciples. He's talking about his own people, Israel. But he says, "Hey, you know, actually, other people too. They belong to me. They are other sheep in other folds, and I must bring them into my community, my family as well." And Jesus is talking about how he is shepherd of them as well. And if you're not an Israelite today, you're Chinese like me from Malaysia. You know what right? Have I to call Jesus my shepherd, my king? What's well, this verse? Jesus says there are other people who are not Israelite, not Jewish. You know, who have not grown up going to church, maybe. But Jesus intentionally brings them in, and the way that you know that they're already into His community, in His in His family, is that they hear His voice and they recognize His voice. Verse nineteen. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, "He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him?" Others said, "These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind?" So it means, you know, not everyone understood what Jesus is going on about. You know, some called him demon possessed. You know, he's insane. Don't listen to him. But even those who Didn't think that this was a bad thing. They still didn't quite get Jesus. They said he can't be someone who's possessed by a demon because he opened the eyes of the blind. They still went, hmm, you know, I don't think so. But they still didn't quite follow. They didn't quite accept what Jesus was saying about listening to him and being their good shepherd. Verse twenty-two. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple. In the colonnade of Solomon, so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, "How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly." Jesus answered them, "I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me." I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Verse twenty-six is so convicting. He says, "You do not believe, because you are not among my sheep." And usually, you think it's the other way around. Oh, I believe you, Jesus. Then Jesus says, "Okay, come in, come in," <laughs> or say, I, "I, I'm going to go to your church." Therefore, oh, Jesus says, "Come in, come in into my kingdom," and you think it's something that you do that makes you qualified to be belong to Jesus to become His sheep. But He says, "No, you become my sheep, and therefore you believe. And therefore, if you do not believe, it means it's because you're not in my sheep. You know, it's Jesus saying, 'I am the one who gives that belief because I'm the one who decides who is in.'" And it was out. It's not actually up to you, and therefore, an encouraging thing to take from this is that if at all any of this makes sense, if all you go, wow, you know, this actually sounds like something that is so attractive, and just makes sense, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know how I get this, but Jesus really does seem to be speaking to me and speaking to me directly, and he, his voice is some something in someone that I recognize. Jesus is saying that's a byproduct. 
of Him already making us His sheep, bringing us into His fold. And therefore, if we come to that point of belief and trust in Him, He gave us that ability. It's not that we worked it out or we are so smart, but that any act of repentance and belief and trust and faith in Jesus Christ is because He has already given us that. He initiates it, He speaks to us, and we listen to Him and go, yep, I recognize that as your voice, Jesus speaking to me. Verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God. If I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father." Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. And it's really interesting. Here are people, who, um, they pick up stones, verse 31, they want to kill Jesus. <laughs> And Jesus essentially says, why is it that you want to kill me? You know, is it because of these works that I've done, these miracles? And they actually openly admit, they say, oh, it's not because of that. That, that looks okay. But because of this, we're going to kill you. And Jesus is saying, you know, there's such a thing as if people who reject him, even though they accept him in one other area, said, oh, it's not because you did all these things that is true, that is good, it actually almost proves that you're true and that you're good and maybe even God. But, you know, I'm going to put that all out of mind. And I'm just going to, going to concentrate on this bit that allows me to condemn you, to convict you, and to hate you. And it shows that sometimes, um, and often, I think every time, we tend to choose what we believe based on preference, not on evidence, not because it's true or because it's good, but because I already want to believe in this thing. Therefore, I'm going to ignore anything that goes against my belief. I'm going to concentrate on this thing that allows me to believe just what I want to, even if it's irrational, even if it causes me to kill someone and hate someone. And, you know, it's, it's funny, isn't it? You know, this idea of being able to pick and choose what we want to believe and then so that we can do the thing that we want to do. And Jesus is saying, you know, uh, you, you know, your convictions will convict you. <laughs> you know, you know. Does he says, doesn't your law say this? Doesn't the scripture say this? And therefore, he's almost reasoning with these people who are trying to kill him. Do you notice that he didn't say, "Oh, you guys are bad," or "You guys are so silly." But he says, "Wait, you believe in this? You believe in the works, and you actually believe in the scriptures that testify to the works. Why is it?" that you don't connect the dots and therefore come to the conclusion that these things that you do believe you believe in point towards. They point towards Jesus being God. They point towards all these works. Well, at the very least, at the very least saying that he's come from God, that he actually isn't speaking against God. But somehow, even though they, they can see that this is something that God has done, they say that this person is blaspheming against God. Even though this is something good, they call it bad. Even though it's something that's true, they call it false. And I know that there is that problematic verse about, you know, you call them gods. You know, I, I admit, I, I need to read up a bit on this. I'm just reading this for the first time. So I'm not quite as familiar with that. I think it comes from the Psalms. I might, might be wrong. So please forgive me if I'm wrong. And I'll, I'll read out on that. Maybe in the next uh, show this evening, I'll comment a bit on that. But still, 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 you know, Jesus is almost reasoning with them. And sometimes, you know, we have to be very careful when we as Christians, and, and, and no, uh, I'm just speaking to my Christian brothers and sisters, where out of our convictions that we don't, that is based on the Bible, after a while we remember the convictions and we forget the Bible. After a while we remember the thing that we were so excited about 
but we forget what made us excited about it, especially if it's scripture, if it's truth. And Jesus is saying it's very dangerous when you divorce the two. You, know, you divorce the basis of that truth, the basis of that conviction, such that you know after a while when that's gone, suddenly you change your conviction and then you ignore, <laughs> ignore the truth that that conviction is based on. Even even as a Christian, and I, I one of the reasons why I do this kind of thing every day, you know, reading the Bible, is to remind myself, hey, this is where I get the idea of, you know, earlier on being filled with the Spirit of God. Here, you know, Jesus saying that He's the Good Shepherd. You know, it's finding that basis and that foundation again, so that the convictions that come from that, so that the actions and the reactions that come from that, you know, they are able to be linked to that source of truth. Because, because it can, the opposite can happen. You can actually believe in this thing. And then because you want to act a different way, you ignore everything you believe in and you trust in. And in your own self, you become inconsistent. At least that's for me. You know, that's a really, really um, a real thing, I think. Uh, sometimes, you know, you just want to do something, you want to react in a certain way. Especially if it's unloving, if I'm honest. If I actually don't want to accept that particular position and that particular reaction coming from that particular brother or sister or that ministry. And therefore, suddenly when the Bible says, hey, actually those guys are speaking something that is true and loving and right, I say, okay, I want to ignore that. And therefore I ignore this as well. Very, very dangerous. Very, very real. Jesus says, why are you doing that? At least he's saying that to me. Um, but I think the opposite is true as well. If you have that conviction, if you know that it is true, it helps you to be extra loving. It helps you remember why it is that you believe and you act and you live that way because that foundation is there, that conviction is there, that truth is still there in the Bible and in your hearts and in your minds. Okay, all right, uh, that's a good place to end. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, let me pray, just pray these things into my heart today. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these words of Jesus Christ that remind us, reminds us of his goodness and reminds us of his care as our shepherd. He is this most loving and sacrificial shepherd. You know, he gives his life for us. And therefore lies his authority. He lays down his life, but also his love. You know, he sacrificially you know, does this out of love and care for us. Uh, we look to the cross and that's what, what we see. We see our good shepherd laying down his life for us. And we look now forward to the resurrection and his return. That's where we see his authority to come to rule and to judge and to save us as our king. So thank you and praise you for that. Help us to constantly see that. You know, I want to reflect on this throughout the day to see how Jesus really is that good shepherd. Now, thank you as well for all those references about the Spirit of God, how you give us your Spirit now dwells within us, but also in this particular way so that we can do your will. For Bezalel and Oholiab, how they're filled with your Spirit so they can serve you in this peculiar way, in this creative way that honors you and really sanctifies us through you. Uh, for those of us who are serving you, especially in ministries, you know, I pray for myself tomorrow as I help out with the music. Uh, help me to be just keeping in step with the Spirit, to be so conscious of His holy presence within me, and to rely on that, to trust in that. You know, sometimes I get nervous. Sometimes I wonder, oh no, how do I do this? How do I work towards this? But to trust that you equip us in everything that you want us to do, and to do so in a loving way, in a trusting way such that in, at the end of the day, it's seen that it is you who have done this, it's all for your glory, and it is you all out of your love for us in Jesus Christ. So we thank you, we praise you, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>